it has been called. So go ahead and drop it on Herschel. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Down goes Herschel Walker, down goes Herschel Walker. Oh, thank God, down goes yeah. Herschel Walker. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Raphael Warnock has won re-election uh, to the Senate. Uh, the Senate is 51-49, it is now. Uh, Democrats will control committees, not just in an even committee. They will have an imbalance of members of each committee in the Senate. They will dictate the agenda of the Senate. Uh, it will be more difficult for the Republican House to push things onto a Senate, not impossible. And we know the tenor of these Democrats. And as Cenk has talked about, the spine and backbone is sometimes flimsy. But this is a great place for them to start the next uh, Congress. Uh, and it's certainly, I would say, unexpected uh, going into last year. Okay, so now let's talk about what's actually going to happen. Now that we know the composition of the Senate, 5149. Uh, so number one, uh, nothing is the correct answer. And it would be nothing almost under any circumstance to be honest with you. So I'm not trying to, this is not me trying to pick on Democrats uh, because the Republicans have the House. So it is what it is, whenever there's a split legislature, you're gonna get usually approximately Zero done. Okay. Right. The presidential election begins tonight. Basically. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, now, having said that, um, usually what happens in uh, these kind of situations is somehow they find a way to pass tax cuts for the rich. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not on the agenda, and, and Biden has never said anything like that. But that's usually what happens. <laughs> so so we'll see, we'll see. But uh, but is there? I'll ask both of you guys, is there any conceivable way that the Democratic Party could pass any of the remaining Biden agenda? I mean, I'm not even 100% sure they'd be able to do that if they'd held the House, I don't know. Um, I, I guess you could come up with some way in which the chaos in the House over choosing the speaker results in some moderate Republicans being willing to go along in some bipartisan legislation, I'm not sure. I mean. We have the lame duck session, it's possible something could be done during then. And the fact that they held the Senate is obviously crucially important for the next two years when it comes to actually being able to fill the many vacant judicial spots, as well as have you know a snowball's chance in hell of actually putting someone on the Supreme Court if that happens in the next two years. So in terms of legislation, I don't have much expectations, but there are still consequential things that can be done. I think non-Trump Republicans in the House would be what the tell is, right? How how toxic Trump becomes over the next several months will dictate whether or not they want to position themselves against those freedom caucusers and those real MAGA MAGA Republicans in the House. In which case, you could maybe see some things getting done, uh, but not not at the top of what we know to be Biden's agenda right now. So I, I think that it's going to be it'll be careful. The other thing is how quickly if Biden uh, decides not to run when he announces that if it's next summer, then you have a lame a real lame duck president and you're going to have people positioning themselves for a presidential election that would look very different if 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 the president uh, were to run again. So there are lots of things from outside that will come into play as well. And the House, you know, I, I think John makes a good point. Whatever happens happens in that leadership fight, uh, it's gonna be a tenuous hold on the speakership, but presumably as we've seen before from Republicans with John Boehner and then moving in Paul Ryan after they went through two or three people who they thought would, would be there, one of them at that time, also McCarthy. So I think that there's a real chance uh, that uh, that Republican infighting will, will may benefit some legislation. You're not gonna, we're not gonna be talking about the, this Congress for, for years to come. Okay, so, uh, I'll channel John McLaughlin here. Correct answer. <laughs> Democrats get nothing done, and they're ecstatic about it. <laughs> okay, so there's there's more nuance. Let, let, let me say the rest in my actual voice. Um, so, uh, number one, uh, it's too bad because that was such a good imitation. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Uh, so look. Uh, I don't think Democrats want to pass anything going forward anyway. So, and I say, I don't say that in like some just blanket cynical way. Uh, so Biden announced what his agenda was, and uh, number one, uh, I, I don't think he believed 85% of that agenda. So here's my proof to that effect. You know, the $15 minimum wage was supposed to be one of the first things done, very easy. I was told a hundred times. Yep. Uh, and then not only did they, the Republicans voted down, but eight Democrats voted against it, including. 
Biden's top two allies, the two senators from Delaware. So there's, it's inconceivable that they voted on that without asking the White House. So the White House obviously told them, no, we were lying. Just go ahead and vote against the $15 minimum wage. We don't want any part of that, okay? So now the Manchester side deal is back in the lame duck session. And today it's reported, why is it back? When again, I was told the same exact thing, including from people inside Congress. Oh, Jake, you're worrying about nothing. We're definitely gonna get $15 minimum wage. It's already, it, that's a done deal, I heard. And then now uh, I had heard up until today, oh, the Manchester side deal is killed. There's, that's a done deal. There's we no way about that on Friday. It. Yeah, that's right. And then guess what? It's not a done deal. And why? Today's reporting is Joe Biden wanted it back in. Because Joe Biden is Joe Manchin. He never wanted to do 85% of his agenda. He did exactly what he wanted to do, about 15% of his agenda, good enough to do okay in these midterm elections and coast the rest of the way without hassling any of his donors and not taking too much flack from his voters. Because now he could do the most reliable democratic tagline of my lifetime. There's nothing I could do. Oh, They love it when there's nothing they can do. So they're not even gonna try, of course. Now. I say of course, but in reality, if you wanted to, you could try a thousand things. And by the way, you could win on 500 of those. So you're not gonna win on defund the police or anything like that. And there isn't a single Democrat, maybe exception of two people that are in favor of that in the in Congress, right? And certainly not Joe Biden. So when you're talking about real policies, real policies that Democrats are actually in favor of, it, they could put a ton of pressure on a couple of Republicans in swing districts in the House. And they could, maybe they could win a vote in the House, right? And then they have the Senate and they have the presidency. So how do you put pressure on people? Well, you say, all right, I'm gonna put up paid family leave. Polls mm -hmm. at 80%, go ahead, vote against it. Just paid family leave. I'm not confusing it with all these other BS stuff. No, 80%, go ahead, go ahead, vote against it, okay? Will they do that? That's the easiest, most obvious thing in politics. Approximately 0% chance they do it. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're gonna say for two years, oh, there's nothing we could do. And then they're gonna go high five with their donors. CNBC's already celebrating. They wrote an article, actually before the midterms, saying the markets were looking forward to a split Congress, because that means gridlock, and the markets love gridlock. Why do the markets love gridlock? Because it protects the status quo. Yep. And who's on top in the status quo? The people running the markets, okay? So that's why they love it. So nothing will get done at all, except, in the lame duck session, they will pass every kind of dirty deal that corporate Democrats and corporate Republicans actually still want to do. And they'll do it in the middle of the night and go, oh, this is a lame duck, who could tell? We didn't even know if it was Democrats or Republicans and bipartisan, moderate, censures, etc. And they'll pass crap legislation that the whole country hates, that there's actually bipartisan uh, agreement that we don't want it and we don't like it. And that's why they'll pass it in the lame duck session. There, I solved it for you. <laughs> um, I, I I want to respond to that in sort of a tangential way. I just want to briefly note along the way because I want to say something that's going to make the the audience probably not like me. I want to say a different thing that'll make me them like me less. Uh, now that this race is done, you remember we did a sheet of our predictions of all the races. Oh yeah. yeah. I just want to be clear. Literally, the only one I got wrong was that I thought it would result that we would have a 50-50 Senate, which the math didn't even work out on that based on my predictions. But every other one of the predictions is right. Uh, so now that I've been unbearable. Um, I, I think your read of what will happen is totally right. I think more importantly for people to understand, and I wish the media would acknowledge this, but they have a financial reason not to, uh, the lack of interest in having a situation where anything can get done. Like, I don't think regular people, I don't know, would get why so many people would have a vested interest in nothing being able to be done, whether it's through a split Congress or whether it's through the existence of the filibuster. Things that make it hard to get things done are great for people who are already benefiting. Um, that said, now that we are officially done with the midterms, I do wanna say that while we have been incredibly critical of Biden, rightfully so, all along the way up to and including some of his recent moves like on the rail strike that have been so terrible and he is going to earn a lot of our continued criticism going forward. There were a, there were a few things that I don't, if you would talk to us the day of his election, when he won or the day of his inauguration. I think our read for what would get done was I think critical for a reason. It was pessimistic for a reason, but I think there was more done than we would have predicted. No. And I, 
you don't think that there were more bills passed than we would have given him pre-credit for on election day 2020? No, and I'm gonna fault and more, myself. And, and what about judicial nominees? I mean, no, I mean, no, no, no. But no, also the midterms different. went much better than I think we would have predicted a, a weak centrist president like Biden would preside over. I think we would have assumed he would guess. deliver very little. And that, yeah, exactly. I'm not, I'm not speaking for everybody. I'm mostly speaking about myself. Um, he would deliver very little, and then he would be punished massively in the midterms, which are already predisposed to hurt the the party in power. Yeah. And yet they they did better. Now there are lots of contextual reasons why. I mean, Trump put up a lot of terrible candidates and all that. But anyway, I just we we keep it real with the audience. So this is my read of. Um, I think maybe there were some bright spots that I would not have predicted on election night 2020. Yeah, so John, I, my sense of it is in different directions on, on all that stuff. So number one on uh, things he would have gotten done, uh, I'm gonna fault myself because I would have naively thought that they would have done half the voting rights bill because it was so important to them, to their own that. political careers. Yeah, but you thought he <laughs> So I thought for sure he was gonna do that. It turns out he didn't even do that. I would have given $15 minimum wage 50-50 because they kept saying that's the first thing up that's so easy. We're definitely going to do it. And guys, I, I'm, it's not hyperbole. I was on the phone. You're with, quoting the president you're criticizing. Yeah. It's not hyperbole, folks, this is I know, yeah. yeah, listen, guys, this is real, this is, no, seriously. Um, I talked to members of Congress, so it's not like it was theoretical. No, they were positive that $15 minimum wage was going to be easy, not worth discussing. So they didn't do a lot of the bare minimum. And what passed? Freaking semiconductor industry gets $50 billion? I guess I marginally care that we're independent in that regard. But you know who really cares? The corporations that paid Biden and a lot of Republicans to pass a $50 billion gift to the semiconductor industry. By the way, that's our goddamn money. They're, they're plenty rich. And by the way, what did Intel do? Intel said, oh, we're gonna create so many jobs if you're passing that bill. And what did they do right after the bill? They outsourced 8,000 jobs, I believe it was. But they, whatever the number was, it was a giant number. Because this is all a joke. They're just funneling money to all their donors. That's almost entirely what they got done. So they, they get some environmental things passed in Inflation Reduction Act that's positive, yes. Okay, was it close to 50% of the things that we wanted to pass for climate change? No, a lot of things got passed that helps the fossil fuel industry. Okay, so no, I think it was, it was, and but, but at the same time, I told you guys and I still think that, he passed 15% of his agenda, that's my rough, rough sense of it. And I thought Obama passed 5% of his agenda. <laughs> so hey, I guess he tripled Obama in by my estimation. Those are rough estimates too. And I mean, you can go through and figure out what the percentage is and why they weren't passed. It's not up to Joe Biden to pass those things. So it's a Congress that does it, it's a president who puts it forward. So I, you can't just put it all on Biden. I can. But that's, well, you can, but you'd be wrong to do that. No, I and, would and break and every uh, ankle there was until I got the goddamn bill passed. Well, well, which is why you'd probably have a tough time winning. But, but uh, no, that's empirically the true. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a very no, glass but that's house. By, by uh, either ways, no, but uh, wait, hold on. I want to yeah. say something about that because Michael is very right about that. I, I'm. I think the Democratic Party should be t ten hundred times more aggressive, right? And I'm positive because of history that that would work. LBJ did it, and he was the most effective. But Roosevelt, FDR did it, and and he was the most effective. The ones who don't do it are the least effective. And we could show a hundred things. This, but in this day and age, if you are an aggressive Democrat, your chance of winning an election is very low because you'll never make it out of the primary. The press and the money and everything else will bury you in a primary. You have almost no chance. The money and the establishment of the parties yeah. more than than anything. But, but the practical matter is there are a couple of good things here, whether it's about specific legislation or not. Uh, that you don't need bipartisanship now to get a subpoena power. You can issue subpoenas without having to rely on someone from the other mm -hmm. power. I think that's terribly important. Uh, I also think that when you have 5149, you're not reliant upon two senators who have been a thorn in the side. So if Chuck Schumer proposes legislation that is to the liking of Democrats, it will be, you know, I'm not here to cast any kind of anything on any of the people involved here. If the leader of the Democrats 
puts forward legislation, it's easier for that legislation to pass whatever it is. That's very important in governance. And I think that the practicality of this win, it, that's why the Republicans were fighting so hard to get this seat won, because they know exactly what that means, yeah. aside from just one seat. This is very important. And uh, a bad day for Vice President Harris, who has less to do. Yeah, <laughs> or, well, or, or a good find day. something or to do. Day. Yeah. Yeah. Also, well, just real quick, I just have to say uh, in regards to what Michael said, I massively agree and disagree on two things. Uh, one is keeping the Senate is really important because it allows you to pass judicial uh, nominees forward. And so winning the Senate is more important than winning the House. The fact that they kept the Senate on the third branch of government alone is very, very important. Okay, that is a real thing. And so that you should celebrate that tonight if you're a Democrat, makes a big difference. The part I wholeheartedly disagree is, okay, now you know you got Manchin and Cinema, they've lost leverage. No, they haven't. Um, there's plenty Democrats, even if they well by right number, now by number they have. It doesn't mean that there aren't other people that are going. It's just more difficult for one senator to hold things up. And yes, that's, that's but all they I'm will, saying. But you know I mean, they will have math. a rotating series there of senators. May, there may be, but Jenk, all I'm saying it's more difficult for that to happen. Yeah, and that's that's not even incorrect or correct. It is just by math alone more difficult for that to happen. Except since I think that 80% of the Democratic senators at least are total frauds, I don't think it moves the math uh, okay. at all. <laughs> okay, so by the, the way, math is moved ex- by the election. It's 51 49 instead <laughs> yeah. of 50 50. It's you're talking you're about assuming the tendencies. That 51 actually are Democrats and, and believe it in the Democratic agenda. Definitively easier to get something through than it was before. Okay. It is, it, it, it still might be impossible to do that. And there still may be senators, but on paper, it is easier to do it. It's 5149. And last thing I'll say about that is that, look, today as we discussed the lame duck session, uh, there was a clear Democratic leaning toward against uh, Saudi Arabia, helping them militarily against Yemen. Okay, Bernie Sanders has been leading the charge saying, hey, let's get out of Yemen. Let's not help Saudi Arabia there anymore. Saudi Arabia slapped us across the face. They slapped Biden across the face uh, by not lowering gas prices before the midterm elections, etc. Right? And so now Biden is leaning towards, hey, yeah, go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, basically pull the funding from Saudi Arabia about the war in Yemen. So that's a great development, right? And all the Democrats were already on the record, or not all, but most of them were. Now, all of a sudden, today I read, there's a couple of Democrats who might switch their mind. Of course, because if they think they're going to actually win a vote, all of a sudden a couple of Democrats reconsider. And look, for foreign countries like Saudi Arabia, it has to go through at least one extra layer before it gets to them. But yeah, they're funneling millions and millions of dollars to those corrupt senators. So do you think that might have something to do with it? Of course it does, of course it does. All of a sudden, you change your mind on Saudi Arabia? Yeah. All of a sudden, please spare me, they're crooks. Yeah. And also just, I believe that Michael, you mentioned this much earlier in the program, but to be clear, like it's very easy to get caught up in this election, especially when it's this election with this potential senator in it. But we need to take, especially as progressives, we need to take sort of the long view. We are trying to, like Littlefinger, we have to fight every battle constantly in all times. Because the 2024 Senate map, everyone seems to agree, looks really bad for the Democrats. So this makes that, you know, the, the numbers check out one better in terms of how difficult that is gonna be right. to maintain control of the Senate. And if we, if we wanna work over the next two years, to have a primary where you have multiple progressives running and we choose one of them, they become a president, but they don't have the Senate then, then that sucks. So we not only need to fight that battle, but this little, these little incremental wins along the way and whatever special elections pop up between now and 2024. We have to win those two, we have to be planning ahead and setting the ground for progressives to finally accomplish things when they finally get in the White House. Yeah, I'll end this segment on this. If the Democrats think that they were God's gift to politics, which they definitely do, and and think, oh no, it wasn't just Trump, it was us. We were so good at this. We should keep doing what we're doing. And it's not Trump as a Republican candidate. That's a couple of ifs, right? Well, one's a guarantee. The Democrats are clearly overconfident right now. If Trump's not the the Republican candidate, 2024 is going to be a slaughterhouse. The Republicans are going to wipe out the Democrats because Democrats are going to go two more years without doing a goddamn thing, and people aren't going to not. Most people don't watch the October. I mean, I hate to say it. I wish they did, right? We have a lot of viewers, but the overwhelming majority of people watch 
a billion other kinds of media, right? And so they won't hear the same thing you guys are hearing. And so most of them won't even understand the concept of a split legislature. They'll just think yeah. the Democrats were in charge. I see Biden right there. And they didn't do anything, right? And the Republicans, meanwhile, will use the House to have all sorts of nonsense hearings where they pound the Democrats politically. And remember, without Trump, the Republican candidates like Brian Kemp, DeSantis, and Greg Abbott killed, not only killed the Democrats, of course, politically again, these are crazy times, so I have to clarify that, right? <laughs> okay, but, but they beat so called stars in the Democratic Party. Beto O'Rourke, Stacey Abrams, etc., and 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 they dismiss them. So the Republicans are doing really well minus Trump, and the results of this midterm election has buried that and made it unclear and given the Democrats overconfidence. So I think we're in a world of trouble in 2024. And John is right; the Senate map looks much worse for the Democrats in 24, I mean, it's, which it's, is an, yeah. an additional. Gigantic I, I, I don't know that it looks or it looks just as challenging as this one did. I think. I mean, I think you 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 have uh, John Tester in Montana. I mean, look, when you look at red states, you have Jackie Rosen in Nevada, which was very competitive this time for Cortez Masto. But Jackie Rosen, maybe you know, she doesn't have the ha Harry Reid machine behind her in Nevada in the same way, but she's a uh, uh, as as Ma Cortez Masto did, but. Nonetheless, I, I don't think it's a, a foregone conclusion that this is a. I think that this gives could give Democratic candidates momentum going into 2024, and also realizing that picking good candidates is much better than picking ones that you think might be good, is what the Republicans did with the celebrity candidates yeah. this time around. And so I, I don't. I don't think it's as bleak. I mean, if you look around that map, Angus King in Maine, maybe Maine independent. I mean, is an independent in Maine. I, I, that's an attractive uh, seat, perhaps. And then of course Ted Cruz, the Democrats are going to mount a, a campaign against him, which obviously won't do well, but we'll see. Uh, and and, and so Rick Scott may not run. Uh, Glenn Youngkin may run against Tim Kaine in Virginia if Tim Kaine runs again. I, there, there's so many different factors at play here that I don't think that I don't think it looks so terrible for the Democrats objectively as as you might think in 2024. But they have they can't do nothing and expect to do well. Thanks for watching the Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.